The world is coming to a climax. We're getting closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So what do we do as we experience the signs of the times? What does America need to do to preserve and secure her foundations? When the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? That's straight ahead as Arkansas Live starts right now. Thank you for joining me for today's edition of Arkansas Alive. You know, the overall plan of God needs to be communicated over and over so people will not lose sight of where we're going, where we are, how to get to where we're going from where we are. God created man in his own image. And male and female created them. God created the earth for man, but God created man for himself. In Romans 13, we see that God, and of course, all the way through the Old Testament, God gave uh, the judges, he gave the law, etc. But in Romans 13 in the New Testament, we find that God established civil government. <clears throat> he let the people decide who, who they wanted in there to serve, but God established civil government. The government was not to provide for the people. The government was to uh, keep the people safe and allow them to pursue uh, their relationship with God, to punish the evildoer and to protect the innocent. All through the scriptures, we see this uh, paradigm uh, explained. The Old Testament, when God went to Abraham and said, Abraham, uh, I know you'll do what I ask you to do. I've seen you take care of your family to keep justice and judgment. Uh, I'm concerned about Sodom and Gomorrah. The sin, the wickedness has come up to me. I want you to go down. I want to, I'm going to go down. I want you to go down and we're going to make a judicial investigation. Have they reached their climax? Have they reached their tipping point? If not, I will know. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, preach the gospel to them. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He did. They repented. He saved the whole, the whole place. So God has always desired to heal, to redeem, to save, to preserve. But he always had a righteous remnant that he worked through. Of course, today, that righteous remnant is the church, the body of Christ. If we go to Proverbs, uh, excuse me, Psalm 11, verse 3, it says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, here again, he calls upon the righteous, those that are right with God, in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, as in, Noah, as in Abraham's day, Noah's day, our day. And he says, if the foundations be destroyed. What does that word foundations refer to? Well, I looked it up. It means moral, political, and economic. And he says, let's read it that way. If the moral, political, and economic foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? He didn't say, what will the government do? He said, <coughs> excuse me, what will the righteous do? What are those that are called by my name? What are they going to do? Today, we could say it this way. What are we going to do as the righteous, as those that are right with God through Christ? If you go with me to uh, Proverbs, back up to uh, uh, Proverbs, well, there's several I want to look at. Let's go to Proverbs 13, 34 first. Proverbs 13, 34. It says, righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people. 
if you go over to, let's say, Proverbs 29, I think is the next reference. If you go over to Proverbs 29 and verse 2, Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous are in leadership, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bears rule, the people mourn. Righteousness exalts a nation. So all through the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, God always holds the righteous responsible for their nation, for their city, for their state, etc. For the moral, political, and economic foundations. If the foundations are crumbling, God always sends a righteous representative to go into that city or nation uh, to uh, bring it to itself or to its knees, however it needs to be. <clears throat> let's look at Genesis and let's look at chapter 18. Uh, and begin reading with me at verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will commend his children and his household after him. They'll keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So all of this was designed to enable God to fulfill his promise. And his promise to Abraham was that he would be heir of the world. In Galatians 3.29 says, if we are Christ's, would then we're Abraham's seed. So we are grafted in to the promise that God made Abraham through Christ. So we qualify. So it behooves us to know what this promise was, that he would be heir of the world. Now, he said to uh, Abram, he said, uh, the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah has come up before me. It's very grievous. So he and Abraham start talking. And knowing how God functions, Abraham said, yeah, what if there are 50 righteous? Because he knew that the sin would bring destruction. And he said, what, what, what about the righteous? It, we, it's, not, it's not right for you to destroy the righteous with the wicked. Far be it from you, he said, to destroy the righteous with the wicked. The judge of the earth doeth right. And God agreed, said, you're right. I won't destroy the, the, the wicked if you can find 50 righteous. Now, notice God's MO, God's concern. He didn't want to destroy the wicked. He wanted them to judge themselves and repent so he could save Sodom and Gomorrah. But he called on the righteous to stand in the gap. The same with Jonah. God didn't want to destroy Nineveh. He called Jonah to go to Nineveh, preach to them the gospel that he had given him. Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. They repented. The governor had the, uh, the prophecy, the, the message printed and distributed. They repented and 170,000 people were saved. <clears throat> Plus all of their property, livestock and everything. So this is God's pattern. He's, he does this time after time after time after time. <coughs> then you get over into the, <coughs> excuse me, the epistles. And the apostle Paul, by revelation, tells us that we're not fighting against flesh and blood. People are not our enemies. We're fighting against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Jesus said, Luke 10, 18, 19, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. The first war that's mentioned in the Bible is the war in heaven between God and Satan. Satan hates God. He hates his church. He hates Jesus. He hates you. He hates me. He is a hater. That's where hate comes from. He's a liar. He's the chief of liars. That's where lying comes from. 
So Satan wanted to dethrone God. He wanted to be God. Well, when he attempted to dethrone God, God threw him out of heaven, cast him to the earth. Jesus told his disciples, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Now get this, Satan is still trying to do the exact same thing that he tried in the beginning he has never stopped. He still wants to be God. He still hates all those created in the image and likeness of God. That's where all the trouble comes from. It's not the people. It's the demonic powers. The spirit of Antichrist is in the earth now, the Bible says. But after the church is caught up and taken out, then the Antichrist is going to be fully escalated and manifested in this earth globally. Now, there's debate on whether the Antichrist will control the whole world or not, but the Antichrist will be loosed on the world. And it's, it means exactly that, Antichrist. Keep in mind that all, all attempts to silence, shut down the church is the spirit of Antichrist. That Antichrist, and the Bible teaches that there is a person that the Antichrist will inhabit and operate through, he and the false prophet. A beast system will be derived. And all those that are alive on the planet during this time period, which is the great tribulation period, we'll have to either take the mark of the beast system or be martyred. Satan is never going to give up his plan, which is to destroy God and to destroy the church. Now, Jesus already told Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So we know the church company is saved is the remnant that is going to be saved. Satan cannot prevail against the church, the body of Christ. But his attempt to steal, kill, and destroy will continue as long as he is a free moral agent until he is thrown into the lake of fire along with the beast and the false prophet. Now, he'll be loosed for a season. He'll be locked up for a thousand years, but then he'll be loosed for a season and then cast into the lake of fire. Now, I'm just trying to give you a synopsis of historical perspective of everything. Um, so God's talking to Abraham. God talked to Jonah. God talked to the righteous that's Proverbs. Righteousness exalts a nation. When the righteous are in leadership, people rejoice. Now, when you preach that to the masses, you get a, a pushback because all they see is self-righteous. We don't want to be governed by you. You're not our boss. You're not going to tell us what to do, blah, blah, blah. That's the spirit of Antichrist. That's anti-God, Antichrist. Now, granted, some Christians make a mess of things, and it's understandable why people <laughs> don't want to be, you know, uh, under somebody's authority. Uh, but nevertheless, this, this, this is God's plan. Now, what must America do uh, for the remaining time that we have here? What do Americans need to do? Well, let's go to 2 Timothy. <clears throat> and let's listen to what the Apostle Paul said uh, to, to Timothy. Second Timothy. And let's see. Second Timothy. Chapter two. I'll get it in a minute here. They're all stuck together. Second Timothy. Chapter 2, 
and verse, well, no, 2 Timothy 3, 14. And then we'll come back to 1 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Continue in the things which you've learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you've learned them. The Lord gave me what I call my proverb, I guess two or three years ago. He said to me, what you know, you know. What you think you know, you don't. And what you don't know, you will. The last couple of years, I have gleaned much more knowledge of things that I did not know. He said, what you don't know, you will. What you think you know, you don't. But what you know, you know. There are things that I know that I know that you can never take from me. Things that I thought I knew, I found out I didn't. But the things I didn't know, I now know. The things that you don't know, you will. So the scripture uh, says here, continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing of whom you've loved them. So what do we do? What has America got to do? America must really do three things. Um, number one, we must fervently pray for our nation and its leaders every day. Now, I know that there are people that do that. There are people that try to do that. And there are people that don't do that. So I know everybody is not going to do this. But this is what we must do. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For all those in authority, for kings and all those in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, <clears throat> until the Prince of Peace comes, until Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom in the earth. And of course, I'm talking to you right now. We tend to think in terms of America. You know, when, when you say all the earth, we really don't think of all the earth. We think of America because that's our nation. That's our home. But there are Christians in other nations. There are believers in other nations. There are the righteous in other nations. And Jesus is Lord of all. So Jesus has followers all over the world, not just in America. And it says, if we will pray for all that are in authority, kings, leaders of men, whatever, we will lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So it is possible before Jesus comes, before he comes back to find faith on the earth, it's possible for us to have a quiet and peaceable life in godly life if we do these three things. Number one is if we fervently pray for our nation <clears throat> and our leaders every day. If we fervently pray, fervent. Let's take a look at that word. Let's go over to James chapter 5 and verse 16. James chapter 5 and verse 16. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and if he've committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much or produces a great and mighty power. Now that word fervent means white hot. That, that, that kind of prayer is not, uh, now I lay me down to sleep. That kind of prayer is not, 
our Father which art in heaven. That kind of prayer is not learned. It's not scripted. That kind of prayer is spiritually initiated. That kind of prayer comes out of a belly that's on fire. I, I brought with me to the studio this morning this prophecy that was given at the very end of the return. This was Jonathan Kahn's uh, meeting in Washington, D.C. back in September. And at the end of the event, it was, it was about four or five hours on Friday night, all day Saturday. It was about 15 hours. Jeannie and I watched every bit of it. And at the very end, a young man <clears throat> came up to the microphone <clears throat> that I did not know. I had never heard from. I never heard of him. <clears throat> I looked him up on the uh, internet, and he is the pastor of a church in Nashville, Tennessee, and his name is Kent Christmas. Kent K E N T Christmas. You can look him up yourself. And this young man, uh, I heard Tim Hill who was an overseer for the Church of God, say that he was sitting there and he was watching Kent Christmas. He wanted to say something to him, but he said, I saw, I saw such a power of God on him. I did not disturb him. I, did, I didn't want to break whatever he was experiencing. And he said, so I didn't say anything to him. He said, then when he was called on to come to the mic, he said he just exploded. <laughs> I wish you could watch it. I wish I had it here to show it to you. But he said things that were going to take place starting January 20th of 2021. He talked about the Holy Spirit. Uh, he talked about the power of God that was going to come. And from 2021 to 2024, for four years, he said the final harvest is going to hit the church no demon can stop the glory of the Lord that's coming. He said, get ready for it. Um, he went on to say a lot of things. He'd pull down strongholds over this nation. Uh, but he said, he said this. Let me see if I can find it. He talked about the things that were going to happen, uh, things that would not um, come back after the COVID-19 one of the things that he said was, is that sports will not come back. He said sports will not uh, be re revitalized. And he said theaters will remain empty. So there's a lot of things that he said are going to go down, take a back place to the Spirit of God. He said... Uh, there's a spirit of Jezebel in the land that's going to be broken. The glory of God is getting ready to come down on this nation. And the Lord said, I've not forgotten. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Um, he said, there's another revival coming. And uh, he said, I want the church to know. He said, I've told you that whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. He said, get ready for the harvest of souls. Your churches are going to fill up. Children are going to praise the Lord. Your bodies are going to be healed. And he, he, he says that the church is going to explode under an empowerment, an anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the fervency that is required. And the only way you can have that fervency is if you spend time uh, with the Lord. So number one, to keep going, continue in what you've learned. You have to continue to fervently pray for our nation and its leaders every day. That way, when Jesus returns, he will find faith on the earth. Secondly, we have to continue to live a godly, righteous life individuals, every one of us. I think we forget sometimes that our life is hid in God with Christ and that, uh, that our life with God does not just consist of an hour or two on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. It, that, it, 
God is not compartmentalized like that. Our life with God is 24-7. And we have to continue to live a godly, righteous life. Right with God. Walk in His love. Walk in His forgiveness. Walk in His righteousness. Yeah, looking for Him. Waiting for Him. Working for Him. Occupying. Everybody. All the time. Not just Sundays, Wednesdays, and whatever. Uh, because the Bible says, we read it in Proverbs thirteen thirty four. It says, righteousness exalts a nation. The nation will be exalted because of the righteous. Everybody benefits, but it's the righteous that God looks to. That's what he told Abraham. He said, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to destroy the place if you can find 10 righteous. I'm looking for somebody that will stand in the gap for the land. He said in Proverbs, uh, Psalm eleven three, that if the foundations be destroyed, moral, political, economic, what will the righteous do? And then third or last, three things America must do. Fervently pray for the nation. Two, continue to live a godly, righteous life. Three, continue to support and pray for the nation of Israel. I tell you what, I don't think the church realizes how important Israel is uh, to America and to the church. Now, there was a replacement theology theory that, you know, somebody tried to put in there where the church replaced Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. So we need to pray for Israel, for the peace of Jerusalem. As long as we pray and support Israel, according to Genesis 12, 3, God will bless those who bless Israel. So don't, be, don't ever be critical or afraid of us blessing Israel. By blessing Israel, we bless ourselves. Thanks for joining me today. And remember, Jesus is Lord over Arkansas and wherever in the world you're watching, too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection. And follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.